This American had started from London when he was young, and he wanted to do the old town a good turn. Then, again, I have heard it is no use your applying if your hair is light red, or dark red, or anything but real bright, blazing, fiery red. Now, if you cared to apply, Mr. Wilson, you would just walk in, but perhaps it would hardly be worth your while to put yourself out of the way for the sake of a few hundred pounds. Now, it is a fact, gentlemen, Vincent Spaulding seemed to know so much about it that I thought he might prove useful, so I just ordered him to put up the shutters for the day and to come right away with me. He was very willing to have a holiday, so we shut the business up and started off for the address that was given us in the advertisement. I never hope to see such a sight as that again, Mr. Holmes. From north, south, east, and west every man who had a shade of red in his hair had tramped into the city to answer the advertisement. Fleet Street was choked with red-headed folk, and Pope's Court looked like a coster's orange barrow. I should not have thought there were so many in the whole country as were brought together by that single advertisement. Every shade of color they were straw, lemon, orange, brick, irish setter, liver clay, but as Spalding said, there were not many who had the real vivid flame colored tint. When I saw how many were waiting, I would have given it up in despair, but Spalding would not hear of it. How he did it I could not imagine, but he pushed and pulled and butted until he got me through the crowd, and right up to the steps which led to the office. There was a double stream upon the stair, some going up in hope, and some coming back dejected but we wedged in as well as we could and soon found ourselves in the office. Pray continue your very interesting statement. There was nothing in the office but a couple of wooden chairs and a deal table, behind which sat a small man with a head that was even redder than mine. He said a few words to each candidate as he came up, and then he always managed to find some fault in them which would disqualify them. Getting a vacancy did not seem to be such a very easy matter, after all. However, when our turn came, the little man was much more favorable to me than to any of the others, and he closed the door as we entered, so that he might have a private word with us. This is Mr. Jabez Wilson, said my assistant, and he is willing to fill a vacancy in the league, and he is admirably suited for it, the other answered. He has every requirement. I cannot recall when I have seen anything so fine. He took a step backward, cocked his head on one side, and gazed at my hair until I felt quite bashful. Then suddenly he plunged forward, wrung my hand, and congratulated me warmly on my success. It would be injustice to hesitate, said he. You will, however, I am sure, excuse me for taking an obvious precaution. With that he seized my hair in both his hands, and tugged until I yelled with the pain. There is water in your eyes, said he as he released me. I perceive that all is as it should be. But we have to be careful, for we have twice been deceived by wigs and once by paint. I could tell you tales of cobbler's wax which would disgust you with human nature. He stepped over to the window, and shouted through it at the top of his voice that the vacancy was filled. A groan of disappointment came up from below and the folk all trooped away in different directions until there was not a red head to be seen except my own and that of the manager. My name, said he, is Mr. Duncan Ross, and I am myself one of the pensioners on the fund left by our noble benefactor. Are you a married man, Mr. Wilson? Have you a family? I answered that I had not. His face fell immediately. Dear me, he said gravely, that is very serious indeed. I am sorry to hear you say that. The fund was, of course, for the propagation and spread of the red heads as well as for their maintenance. It is exceedingly unfortunate that you should be a bachelor. My face lengthened at this. Mr. Holmes, for I thought that I was not to have the vacancy after all. But after thinking it over for a few minutes, he said that it would be all right. In the case of another said he, the objection might be fatal, but we must stretch a point in favor of a man with such a head of hair as yours. 
When shall you be able to enter upon your new duties? Well, it is a little awkward, for I have a business already, said I. Oh, never mind about that, Mr. Wilson, said Vincent Spaulding. I should be able to look after that for you. What would be the hours, I asked? Ten to two. Now a pawnbroker's business is mostly done of an evening, Mr. Holmes, especially Thursday and Friday evening, which is just before payday, so it would suit me very well to earn a little in the mornings. Besides, I knew that my assistant was a good man, and that he would see to anything that turned up. That would suit me very well, said I, and the pay is for a week, and the work is purely nominal. What do you call purely nominal? Well, you have to be in the office, or at least in the... If you leave, you forfeit your whole position forever. The will is very clear upon that point. You don't comply with the conditions if you budge from the office during that time. It's only four hours a day, and I should not think of leaving, said I. No excuse will avail, said Mr. Duncan Ross neither sickness nor business nor anything else. There you must stay or you lose your billet. And the work is to copy out the Encyclopedia Britannica. There is the first volume of it in that press. You must find your own ink, pens, and blotting paper, but we provide this table and chair. Will you be ready tomorrow? Certainly. I answered. Then, good-bye, Mr. Jabez Wilson and let me congratulate you once more on the important position which you have been fortunate enough to gain. He bowed me out of the room, and I went home with my assistant, hardly knowing what... Well, I thought over the matter all day, and by evening I was in low spirits again, for I had quite persuaded myself that the whole affair must be some great hoax or... F it seemed altogether past belief that anyone could make such a will, or that they would pay such a sum for doing anything so simple as copying out the Encyclopedia Britannica. Vincent Spaulding did what he could to cheer me up, but by bedtime I had reasoned myself out of the whole thing. However, in the morning I determined to have a look at it anyhow, so I bought a penny bottle of ink, and with a quill pen and seven sheets of foolscap paper, I started off for, well, to my surprise and delight. Everything was as right as possible. The table was set out ready for me, and Mr. Duncan Ross was there to see that I got fairly to work. He started me off upon the letter A, and then he left me. But he would drop in from time to time to see that all was right with me. At two o'clock he bade me good day, complimented me upon the amount that I had written, and locked the door of the office after me. This went on day after day. Mr. Holmes, and on Saturday the manager came in and planked down four golden sovereigns for my week's work. It was the same next week, and the same the week after. Every morning I was there at ten, and every afternoon I left at two. By degrees, Mr. Duncan Ross took to coming in only once of a morning, and then, after a time, he did not come in at all. Still, of course, I never dared to leave the room for an instant for I was not sure when he might come, and the billet was such a good one, and suited me so well, that I would not risk eight weeks passed away like this, and I had written about abbots and archery, and armor and architecture and attica, and hoped with diligence that I might get on to the bees before very long. It cost me something in foolscap, and I had pretty nearly filled a shelf with my writings, and then suddenly the whole business came to an end. To an end, yes, sir, and no later than this morning. I went to my work as usual at ten o'clock, but the door was shut and locked, with a little square of cardboard hammered on to the middle of the panel with a tack. Here it is, and you can read for yourself. He held up a piece of white cardboard about the size of a sheet of note paper. It read in this fashion. The red-headed league is dissolved. October 9. 1890. Sherlock Holmes and I surveyed this curt announcement and the rueful face behind it, until the comical side of the affair so completely over... I cannot see that there is anything very funny, cried our client, 
flushing up to the roots of his flaming head. If you can do nothing better than laugh at me, I can go elsewhere. No, no, cried Holmes, shoving him back into the chair from which he had half risen. I really wouldn't miss your case for the world. It is most refreshingly unusual. But there is, if you will excuse my saying so, something just a little funny about it. Pray what steps did you take when you found the card upon the door? I was staggered, sir. I did not know what to do. Then I called at the offices round, but none of them seemed to know anything about it. Finally, I went to the landlord, who is an accountant living on the ground floor, and I asked him if he could tell me what had become of the red-headed league. He said that he had never heard of any such body. Then I asked him who Mr. Duncan Ross was. He answered that the name was new to him. Well, said I, the gentleman at no. For, what, the red-headed man? But yes, ah, said he, his name was William Morris. He was a solicitor and was using my room as a temporary convenience until his new premises were ready. He moved out yesterday. Where could I find him? Oh, at his new offices. He did tell me the address. Yes, 17 King Edward Street, near St. Paul's. I started off, Mr. Holmes, but when I got to that address it was a manufactory of artificial kneecaps, and no one in it had ever heard of either Mr. William Morris or Mr. Duncan Ross. And what did you do then? asked Holmes. I went home to saxe coburg Square, and I took the advice of my assistant. But he could not help me in any way. He could only say that if I waited I should hear by post. But that was not quite good enough, Mr. Holmes. I did not wish to lose such a place without a struggle, so, as I had heard that you were good enough to give advice to poor folk who were in need of it, I came right away to you. And you did very wisely. Your case is an exceedingly remarkable one, and I shall be happy to look into it. From what you have told me, I think that it is possible that graver issues hang from it than might at first sight appear. Grave enough, said Mr. Jabez Wilson. Why, I have lost four pound a week. As far as you are personally concerned, remarked Holmes, I do not see that you have any grievance against this extraordinary league. On the contrary, you are, as I understand, richer by some thirty, to say nothing of the minute knowledge which you have gained on every subject which comes under the letter A. You have lost nothing by them? No, sir. But I want to find out about them, and who they are, and what their object was in playing this prank, if it was a prank upon me. It was a pretty expensive joke for them, for it cost them two and thirty pounds. We shall endeavor to clear up these points for you. And, first, one or two questions. Mr. Wilson, this assistant of yours who first called your attention to the advertisement, how long had he been with you? About a month, then. How did he come? In answer to an advertisement, has a white splash of acid upon his forehead. Holmes sat up in his chair in considerable excitement. I thought as much, said he. Have you ever observed that his ears are pierced for errings? Yes, sir. He told me that a gypsy had done it for him when he was a lad. Hum, said Holmes, sinking back in deep thought. He is still with you. Oh, yes, sir. I have only just left him. And has your business been attended to in your absence? Nothing to complain of, sir. There's never very much to do of a morning. That will do, Mr. Wilson. I shall be happy to give you an opinion upon the subject in the course of a day or two. Today is Saturday, and I hope that by Monday we may come to a conclusion. Well, Watson, said Holmes when our visitor had left us, what do you make of it all? It is a most mysterious business. As a rule, said Holmes, the more bizarre a thing is the less mysterious it proves to be. It is your commonplace, featureless crimes which are really puzzling, just as a commonplace face is the most difficult to identify. But I must be prompt over this matter. What are you going to do, then? I asked. 
To Smoke, he answered, It is quite a three-pie problem, and I beg that you won't speak to me for fifty minutes. He curled himself up in his chair, with his thin knees drawn up to his hawk-like nose. I had come to the conclusion that he had dropped asleep, and indeed was nodding myself, when he suddenly sprang out of his chair with the gesture of a man who has made up his mind and put his Saracate plays at the saint. James Hall this afternoon, he remarked, What do you think, Watson? Could your patience spare you for a few hours? I have nothing to do today. My practice is never very absorbing. Then put on your hat and come. I am going through the city first, and we can have some lunch on the way. I observe that there is a good deal of German music on the program, which is rather more to my taste than Italian or French. It is introspective, and I want it to introspect. Come along, we traveled by the underground as far as Aldersgate. And a short walk took us to Saxe Coburg Square, the scene of the singular story which we had listened to in the morning. It was a poky, little, shabby, genteel place, where four lines of dingy two-storied brick houses looked out into a small railed-in enclosure, where a lawn of weedy grass and a few three gilt balls and a brown board with Jabez Wilson in white letters, upon a corner house, announced the place where our red-headed client carried on his business. Sherlock Holmes stopped in front of it with his head on one side and looked it all over, with his eyes shining brightly between puckered lids. Then he walked slowly up the street, and then down again to the corner, still looking keenly at the houses. Finally he returned to the pawnbroker's, and having thumped vigorously upon the pavement with his stick two or three times, he went up to the door and knocked. It was instantly opened by a bright-looking, clean-shaven young fellow, who asked him to step in. Thank you, said Holmes. I only wished to ask you how you would go from here to the Strand. Third right, fourth left, answered the assistant promptly, closing, smart fellow, that observed Holmes as we walked away. He is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest man in London, and for daring I am not sure that he has not a claim to be third. I have known something of him before. Evidently, said I, Mr. Wilson's assistant counts for a good deal in this mystery of the red-headed league. I am sure that you inquired your way merely in order that you might see him. Not him. What then? the knees of his trousers, and what did you see, what I expected to see. We are spies in an enemy's country. We know something of saxe Coburg Square. Let us now explore the parts which lie behind it. The road in which we found ourselves as we turned round the corner from the retired saxe Coburg Square presented as great a contrast to it as the front of it was one of the main arteries which conveyed the traffic of the city to the north and west. The roadway was blocked with the immense stream of commerce flowing in a double tide inward and outward, while the footpaths were black with the hurrying swarm of pedestrians. It was difficult to realize, as we looked at the line of fine shops and stately business premises, that they really abutted on the other side upon the faded and stagnant square which we had just quitted. Let me see, said Holmes, standing at the corner and glancing along the line, I should like just to remember the order of the houses here. It is a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. There is Mortimer's, the tobacconist, the little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the city and suburban bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarlane's carriage building deposit that carries us right on to the other block. And now, doctor, we've done our work, so it's time we had some play a sandwich and a cup of coffee, and then off to violin land, where all is sweetness and delicacy and harmony, and there are no red-headed clients to vex us with their conundrums. All the afternoon he sat in the stalls wrapped in the most perfect happiness, gently waving his long, thin fingers in time to the music, while his gently smiling face and his... In his singular character the dual nature alternately asserted itself, and his extreme exactness and astuteness represented, as I have often thought, the reaction against the poetic and content. The swing of his nature took him from extreme languor to devouring energy, and, as I knew well, 
He was never so truly formidable as when, for days on end, he had been lounging in his arm. Then it was that the lust of the chase would suddenly come upon him, and that his brilliant reasoning power would rise to the level of intuition, until those who were unacquainted with his methods would look askance at him. When I saw him that afternoon so enwrapped in the music at St. James Hall, I felt that an evil time might be coming upon those whom he had set himself to hunt down. You want to go home, no doubt, doctor, he remarked as we emerged. Yes, it would be as well, and I have some business to do which will take some hours. This business at Coburg Square is serious. Why serious? A considerable crime is in contemplation. I have every reason to believe that we shall be in time to stop it. But today being Saturday rather complicates matters. I shall want your help tonight. At what time? Ten will be early enough. I shall be at Baker Street at ten. Very well. And, I say, doctor, there may be some little danger. So kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. He waved his hand, turned on his heel. I trust that I am not more dense than my neighbors, but I was always oppressed with a sense of my own stupidity in my dealings with Sherlock Holmes. Here I had heard what he had heard, I had seen what he had seen, and yet from his words it was evident that he saw clearly not only what had happened but what was about to happen. While, as I drove home to my house in Kensington, I thought over it all, from the extraordinary story of the red-headed copier of the Encyclopedia down to the visit to Saxe Coburg Square, and the op what was this nocturnal expedition, and why should I go armed? Where were we going, and what were we to do? I had the hint from Holmes that this smooth-faced pawnbroker's assistant was a f I tried to puzzle it out, but gave it up in despair, and set the matter aside until night should bring an explanation. It was a quarter past nine when I started from home and made my way across the park, and so through Oxford Street to Baker Street. Two hansoms were standing at the door, and as I entered the passage I heard the sound of voices from above. On entering his room, I found Holmes in animated conversation with two men, one of whom I recognized as Peter Jones, the official police agent, while the other was a long Ha! Our party is complete said Holmes, buttoning up his pea jacket and taking his heavy hunting crop from the rack. Watson, I think you know Mr. I think you know Mr. Jones of Scotland Yard. Let me introduce you to Mr. Merriweather, who is to be our companion in tonight's adventure. We were hunting in couples again, doctor, you see, said Jones in his consequential way. Our friend here is a wonderful man for starting a chase. All he wants is an old dog to help him to do the running down. I hope a wild goose may not prove to be the end of our chase, observed Mr. Merriweather gloomily. You may place considerable confidence in Mr. Holmes, sir, said the police agent loftily. He has his own little methods, which are, if you won't mind my saying so, just a little too theoretical and fantastic but he has the makings of a detective in him. It is not too much to say that once or twice, as in that business of the Shalter murder and the Agra treasure, he has been more nearly correct than the official force. Oh, if Jones, it is all right, said the stranger with deference. Still, I confess that I miss my rubber. It is the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years that I have not had my rubber. I think you will find said Sherlock Holmes, that you will play for a higher stake tonight than you have ever done yet. For you, Mr. Merriweather, the stake will be some thirty thousand, and for you, Jones, it will be the man upon whom you wish to lay your hands. John Clay, the murderer, he's a young man, Mr. Merriweather, but he is at the head of his profession, and I would rather have my bracelets on him than on any criminal in London. He's a remarkable man, is young John Clay. His grandfather was a royal duke, and he himself has been to Eton and Oxford. His brain is as cunning as his fingers, and though we meet signs of him at every turn, we never know where to find the man himself. 
he'll crack a crib in Scotland one week, and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. I've been on his track for years, and have never set eyes on him yet. I hope that I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. I've had one or two little turns also with Mr. John Clay, and I agree with you that he is at the head of his profession. It is past ten, however, and quite time that we started. If you two will take the first hansom, Watson and I will follow in the second. Sherlock Holmes was not very communicative during the long drive and lay back in the cab humming the tunes which he had. We rattled through an endless labyrinth of gaslit streets until we emerged into Farrington Street. We are closed there now, my friend remarked. This fellow Merriweather is a bank director and personally interested in the matter. I thought it as well to have Jones with us also. He is not a bad fellow, though an absolute imbecile in his profession. He has one positive virtue. He is as brave as a bulldog and as tenacious as a lobster if he gets his claws upon anyone. Here we are, and they are waiting for us. We had reached the same crowded thoroughfare in which we had found ourselves in the morning. Our cabs were dismissed, and, following the guidance of Mr. Merriweather, we passed down a narrow passage and through a side door, which he opened for us. Within there was a small corridor, which ended in a very massive iron gate. This also was opened, and led down a flight of winding stone steps, which terminated at another formidable gate. Mr. Merriweather stopped to light a lantern, and then conducted us down a dark, earth-smelling passage, and so, after opening a third door, into a huge vault or cellar. You are not very vulnerable from above, Holmes remarked as he held up the lantern and gazed about him. Nor from below, said Mr. Merriweather, striking his stick upon the flags which lined the floor. Why, dear me, it sounds quite hollow, he remarked, looking up in surprise. I must really ask you to be a little more quiet, said Holmes severely. You have already imperiled the whole success of our expedition. Might I beg that you would have the goodness to sit down upon one of those boxes, and not to interfere? The solemn Mr. Merriweather perched himself upon a crate, with a very injured expression upon his face, while Holmes fell upon his knees upon the floor and, with the lantern and a magnifying lens, a few seconds sufficed to satisfy him, for he sprang to his feet again and put his glass in his pocket. We have at least an hour before us, he remarked, for they can hardly take any steps until the good pawnbroker is safely in bed. Then they will not lose a minute, for the sooner they do their work, the longer time they will have for their escape. We are at present, doctor, as no doubt you have divined, in the cellar of the city branch of one of the principal London banks. Mr. Merriweather is the chairman of directors and he will explain to you that there are reasons why the more daring criminals of London should take a considerable interest in this cellar at present. It is our friend. We have had several warnings that an attempt might be made upon it. Your French gold? Yes. We had occasion some months ago to strengthen our resources and borrowed for that purpose 30,000 Napoleons from the Bank of France. It has become known that we have never had occasion to unpack the money and that it is still lying in our cellar. The crate upon which I sit contains two thousand napoleons packed between layers of lead foil. Our reserve of bullion is much larger at present than is usually kept in a single branch office, and the directors have had misgivings upon the subject, which were very well justified, and now it is time that we arranged our little plans. I expect that within an hour matters will come to a head, in the meantime, Mr. Merriweather, we must put the screen over that dark lantern and sit in the dark. I am afraid so. I had brought a pack of cards in my pocket, and I thought that, as we were a party carry, 
you might have your rubber after all. But I see that the enemy's preparations have gone so far that we cannot risk the presence of a light. And, first of all, we must choose our positions. These are daring men, and though we shall take them at a disadvantage, they may do us some harm unless we are careful. 